Welcome, welcome to the Shortway Show. Yes, it is 7 p.m. on the East Coast. So you've got to look at my handsome mug. Yes, you do. Absolutely. And you know what I'm going to ask you to do? So just do it. Like, comment, share. Stop fighting me. The urge is for you to comment and to share and like. Let it go. Isn't that what, what was it? Elle says her name? Whatever that woman's name is. Anyway, whatever she says, she says let it go. So let it go. Like comment, share. It does matter. How else are people going to know that we're doing these cool things that we're doing? Of course, if you've got some cash to spare, if you're making an amazing amount of money, throw some my way. Throw me a hundred bucks a month if you got it. If you're so filthy rich, right? You're part of the 1%. Throw some money my way. I love it. If you're not, no worries. 10 bucks, five bucks is fine. And even if you're not, you can just head on over to theadvocates.org. Share that test with your friends. It is the world's smallest political quiz. It's free. Makes me happy, makes my sponsors happy, makes your friends, I don't know if they're happy, but it bothers them, so it makes you happy, so life is still good. And of course, if you are someone where CBD is part of your health regimen, do me a favor, head over to grownselection.com, make your purchase through them, libertarian-owned business, Sharpway 20, get you 20% off. I am very lucky today. I have with me the man who runs, is it Lockout Gays? uh twitter and youtube man who has a video together on how we should be more radical as libertarians Uh uh-oh this could be fun drew (laughs) hancock how are you sir i'm good larry thanks for having me i am very happy that you came on the show today um i i have a a a a crazy question maybe or or maybe not how do you define radical right so what is radical i think people often get confused on is radical, is that audacious, are they the same, are they different, is radical, radical compared to libertarians, or is radical compared to the average, you know, Democrat, Republican running out there? Okay, that's a really good question. So, I mean, yeah, radical depends on what you're talking about. Sure. I would say whenever I talk about radical messaging, I'm talking about saying what you believe and not holding back. Got it, that's okay. What, yeah, that's what I mean. What if that radical message turns someone off, uh, scares them, um, makes them think you're the other because a trigger word affects them. Is, is that is is the risk of that, in your view, eh, it, you know what? This is how we got to work, eh? And sometimes that's going to happen. Or where is your head on that? Yeah, so there is an issue where, you know, maybe you turn people off, and I don't think that you can attract everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's important to attract the people that you can get with a radical message. So if you pander or you water down your message, you're going to turn people off that you could otherwise get by just being yourself. And I think that's a pretty big problem right now. So do you think there is a difference in messaging for, say, an activist on the street um, versus, say, a podcaster versus a versus a candidate, right? Or is there, or does it not matter, right? Should, should the message be the same all the way through? Or does it matter that, hey, I'm a candidate now, so my message must change. Or I'm an activist now, so my message must change. Or I'm a podcaster right now, so my message must change. Yes, I think that rhetorically, you should pretty much have the same message no matter what. Um, if you're an activist and you're out with Black Lives Matter, you probably want to focus more on like police brutality, ending the drug war, um, qualified immunity, that kind of stuff. If you're a political candidate, you probably want to focus more on practical solutions like, hey, ultimately, I think that we should do this, but this may be a practical solution in the meantime. But isn't the practical solution where people get upset? Right? Um, isn't that the point where someone says, the second you say, as an example, and I think you bring this up, if I remember the video, I'll show the video in a second, yeah. but I'm pretty sure you bring up something like, and I'm going to paraphrase, so if I'm wrong, tell me, I'm going from memory. Okay. You, it was something like, um, you know, if you think drugs should be legal, you don't really want to say just marijuana, but isn't that, isn't legalizing cannabis versus decriminalizing everything, isn't legalizing cannabis a solution but is it too watered down? Um, yeah, it certainly is a solution. Um, what my point is, is that you should advocate like, hey, I, I think everything should be legalized, decriminalized, whatever. Um, and if you're going to say, hey, I'll take marijuana legalization. If someone asks you, what do you think about marijuana legalization? Sure, say, yeah, I think it should be 
legalized. There's no problem with that. It's whenever you actively avoid going further than that. Um, so I think a easy way to say it, your ultimate goal should be radical. And if you can meet somewhere before that with just marijuana legalization, you should take it. Um, so another example I use in the video is Gary Johnson wanting mm -hmm. a fair tax. Yep. So I think if rhetorically you say, I think taxation is theft, mm -hmm. there shouldn't be taxes at all. But hey, this may be something that we could do now that's achievable. I think that's fine. As long as you make clear that that's not the end goal. Okay. So let me cover two parts. One with the end goal. Yep. And then two, the idea, if I start my communication with taxation theft, but... <laughs> I would accept so and so, right? Whatever flat tax is an example, right? That's in this specific yeah. case, my my audience, I believe, would accept flat tax, right? In this case, I've mis made up. So I go, look, taxation is theft. There should be no taxation. Yeah. Then I go, but I would take flat tax. Brian, he goes on flat tax. I'll take flat tax. <laughs> do you do you think that message as a candidate is the right message? The wrong message? Does it matter if I'm an activist or not in this case? Or as your, your point earlier was, it's kind of the same either way. I think as a candidate, that would be a unifying message because rhetorically you could get the taxation and stuff. You shouldn't have any taxes, people. And you could also get the more practical kind of people on your side. I just, my problem is whenever Gary Johnson, or not to pick on Gary Johnson, because I like Gary Johnson. I do too. But if so, yeah, if someone just says, I just want a flat or I just want a fair tax and that's it then uh, that's kind of a lame message. If you say, I think taxation is theft, but there are more practical things that we could achieve now. I don't have a problem with that. So what's the ultimate goal then? Is the goal, you said, what's the goal? Is the goal, to, you know, if, if I'm out here right now, I'm, I'm on a sharp way, I'm an activist, yelling and screaming about libertarian stuff, right? What, what, what should be my goal then? Is, is my goal to make actual change? Is my goal to influence 10 people? What is the goal? Excuse me, what is that goal? <laughs> so it's different for everyone. So I think that um, for me personally, I want to influence people. I want to convert more libertarians. I think that should be our primary goal to get more people to be libertarians. Um, so we can't win elections unless there are more libertarians, obviously. Um, so I think ultimately that needs to be my focus as a content creator. Um, and then whenever you're a candidate, you want to try to get more votes you may not get elected you probably won't um but if you can inspire change i don't want to borrow obama's talking points <laughs> hope and change brother hope and change there okay yes, I but, love uh, yeah yeah if you can inspire other people to be libertarians if you can be someone like a ron paul who runs for a political office and inspires a whole movement i think that is the ideal see i have a different view on ron paul and yeah. i know i'm the oddball here right <laughs> most people either love ron paul or hate Ron Paul, right? He, he for <laughs> most libertarians, we either go Ron Paul, that guy's a, he's a Republican or whatever, right? They don't like him, or they go, my God, Ron Paul brought me into the uh, into the movement. He inspired me, and right. Usually, you find one or the other. I'm neither of those, right? I'm neither of those. I'm happy that we had Ron Paul. I'm very happy. A lot of people who were in the movement came in because of Ron Paul. That's true. At the same time, he walked away. So I'm kind of on both sides of that, right? I, I get why someone would be angry and I get why someone would love them. I, I get both sides of that thing. Let, let me do your video. Let me show you a video real fast and we'll walk through it. Is that okay? Yeah. We'll walk through it. Uh, by the way, home before we get there, uh, someone does like your hat. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so there we go. Brandon, Brandon <laughs> likes your hat. Absolutely. Yes, he does. 100%. You, so, all right. Let me, let, me, let me start your video and we'll walk through it. One of my favorite people in the liberty movement is Tom Woods. Although some may dispute its success, he is indisputably brilliant and one of the intellectual leaders of the movement. In this video, I'm going to do a deep dive into an issue that he brings to light and one of my favorite quotes from him and one of my favorite quotes of all time. Now, why did you pick Tom Woods? Um, specifically, it was just because I like the quote that I bring up in the next segment. So I think okay. it's a really good quote. Um, and then Tom Woods, he is a very brave guy. He's going hard on the lockdowns right now. And mm -hmm. uh, he's been a big influence for me. I love his show. Uh, I listened it. to your appearance on his show. I so. was on his show. That's true. <laughs> and he just let me talk and talk and talk. I just kept there talking. You go. Yes. All right. Oddly enough, 
comedian and political commentator Dave Smith, who is problematic. He is known for making derogatory remarks towards Puerto Ricans. Um, I know why he doesn't like Puerto Ricans. He doesn't. I know. <laughs> um, Dave, if you're watching, we know you don't hate Puerto Ricans, which is decent. Yes. Um, yeah. He is the only person I have ever seen or heard comment on the brilliance of this quote. I'm not saying others haven't, but he's the only person who mm -hmm. I am aware he of. He does. Big so Tom Woods fan. I'm going to do a deep dive into it. Yeah. So Tom Woods from the article, Hey everyone, look at me, I'm against slavery, and uh, later published in his book Real Descent, had this to say. You have a lot of courage to oppose slavery in, say, 1855. It takes zero courage to oppose it today. This quote is pure brilliance. Now, I think that's obvious. I'm not sure where you're actually going with that. Are there people who think they're brave for opposing slavery? No, so it's in a... It's just an analogy, so it's just talking about there are easy positions that you can take today that are pretty much widely accepted um, that don't take any bravery to say. And just an extreme example of that would be slavery. So that's okay. All, yeah. Do you think it's a problem, or do you think that there are people now who are, who are taking stances? And and my question is: Is this libertarian movement or non-libertarian? Are there libertarians who you think are taking stances now that aren't brave? Is was that kind of the what was being implied yes joe jorgensen and spike cohen in their last campaign siding with black lives matter actively going against libertarian principles of property rights and free association i that's exactly who i'm attacking with that got it okay no that's clear okay <laughs> all right let me uh let's let's keep going if we can let's see if i can right. keep going let go now hold on one second i'll pop it back up and we'll keep going for a number of reasons so first off, and this is more of a side point, it's completely true, it's inarguable. Uh, someone may try in the comments, but it's completely true that standing against slavery now is completely meaningless. That's true. And standing against yeah. slavery in 1855 took serious bravery. True. Uh, I'm more concerned with the next two points. Um, so second, this has an insight into popular opinion and how popular opinion shifts. Okay. Third is um, the implication of what this means for <laughs> and how we should conduct ourselves. Those last two points are what we're going to take a closer look at. See, I, I, I get what you want in the beginning part, right? I do. Um, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm not sure that I see our movement. I think most libertarians are like, you know, against lockdowns or I, I think most libertarians, if anything, I feel like they're probably too radical, <laughs> right? I mean, if you see many libertarians, and, and maybe it's just my circle, right? But if I see many libertarians, if you were to tell a libertarian, hey, why don't we make a you know a better tax code? The first thing out of their mouth is, why do we have taxes at all? <laughs> like that's the first thing out of their mouth. A am I wrong here? I think that's a fair point. I think obviously most libertarians, I think, are against the lockdowns. I think it just has to do with whether or not they're willing to say that publicly publicly into a non-libertarian or somebody who disagrees with them. Got it. Okay. I think that's what it comes down to. Okay. I'll buy that. Any prevalent idea today was at one point deeply unpopular. Abolitionism, unthinkable 300 years ago. Cryptocurrency, if you brought it up to a group of financial analysts, they would have laughed you out of the room. Uh, DMT elves, absurd. And then they would demand blood. So you didn't want just elves at your event. They're still absurd, but it's fine. <laughs> yeah, they're like a, you know, NPC. Anti-slavery is an extreme example, so we're going to trade slavery for a second for marijuana legalization. All right. So as recently as 20 years ago, it was a bold stance to say that weed should be legalized. Uh, for politicians, not even that long. Ask 2009 Barack Obama. Uh, and that was whether legalizing marijuana would improve uh, the economy and job. Look at them all laughing. Meanwhile, he used to smoke weed like nobody else did when he was in high school and in college. Yeah, I mean, it's awful. Same thing with Kamala Harris. She was putting in she was putting people in jail for for smoking weed and they just laugh about it. It's yes. awful. Ha ha ha. Up creation. I don't know what this says about the online audience. You online people. <laughs> uh, the answer is no. I don't think that is a good strategy to grow our economy. So
Now, recreational use is legal in 15 states and decriminalized in 10 others. Legalization has majority support in the country. That's For true. decades, if you had said weed should be legal, you would have been dismissed and called a stoner. Now, being against marijuana legalization gets you laughed at. So what changed? Um, Simply put, I think brave people stood up or something. So people stood up. They said, hey, I think marijuana should be legalized. I think it's wrong that we're throwing people in jail. Yeah, but see, this is this is the point where uh, I'm unsure about the radical message on this one. And what I mean is when you say I want all drugs, you know, legal or drug criminalized. First off, the average American doesn't know the difference between decriminalization and legal, they don't know the difference. They think it's the same thing. They have no idea that there's a difference at all, right? But if you say I wanted, as an example, I, I want all drugs, you know, decriminalized. I think most Americans still to this day, shut you off. They don't hear it. I don't think, and please correct me if you think I'm wrong here. My gut tells me that it isn't the radical message of let all drugs be, be legal that got us the 25 or so states that now in some way it's legal. I think it's actually people saying, just give us marijuana and you know, Colorado does it, then the rest start doing it. And now we have some actually decriminalization and some legalization. And now people will start thinking, okay, what's the difference? Which one do we want? I would argue that the radical message in this case, I think slowed things down versus speeded things up. Interesting. So, yeah, so with um, weed, it was a radical message at one point. Now I'm saying it's not anymore. Um, I think with it now, it depends on which section of the country you're talking to. So if you're mm-hmm. like me down here in Missouri and you say legalize all drugs, yeah, people are still going to look at you like you're a crazy person. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're out in California or Oregon, then uh, not so much. Absolutely. So I, yeah. But um, I would bet if you went... I mean, look, New York, one of the bluest states there is, if not the bluest, right? Yeah. We are the least free, ranked by Cato more than once. We kick California's ass on that. Uh, <laughs> so, yes, we are really bad. Still, no, not legalized. Still, yeah, I, not legalized. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. I don't see how um, pushing the radical message of legalizing all drugs would hinder it. Um, I think that... Um, going after everything would help. I think that there has been more of a focus towards marijuana legalization, especially mm-hmm. to the left. And I think that's why it has progressed more. Whereas legalization of all drugs has been more kind of a niche thing, pretty much just with us and maybe the green party mm-hmm. and maybe the super radical leftists in the democratic right. party. Um, so that's what I would attribute that to. See, I, I look at it. I look at a big difference and most people disagree with me. And I know I'm the oddball on this one too. I see a big difference between candidates and activists. I see a big difference. And I think the party doesn't in general. And I think that hurts us tremendously. But I get why. The party was started as an activist party. It wasn't started as a party to actually win anything. It started as a party to be activism. And and, and that's what most of us do. I think there's value in an activist yelling, make all make all drugs legal i i agree with you. i think there's lots of value in that right there's a value in an activist yelling taxation is theft i think there's value in that my worry is once you're a candidate you're expected to do you, you, there's a different expectation from the voters right in my view an activist's job is to get the people to care about an issue a candidate's job is to find an answer for the issue that they now care about. If the activists have done their job, and without activists, we have no party. So please, I'm not saying either one's more important. I'm saying that it's like, you know, I need a first baseman, I need a second baseman, I need both, right? I can't just have a first baseman, I gotta have both. So I gotta have activists and I gotta have candidates. So if my activists are doing the right job and people now care about this thing, and the candidate now has an answer for this thing, I think the candidate can get the votes or at least the TV time or the something. And I feel like the activist message should sometimes be very radical, depending upon their audience, obviously. I think the candidates should almost never, almost never be radical compared to their audience. So I completely disagree. And I think the answer for that is Ron Paul. So Ron Paul went on stage in front of Republicans and said, I think we should legalize heroin. Mm -hmm. He went on stage and said, we pretty much provoked 9-11 happening because of blowback. 
-hmm. He said whatever he thought. He said taxation is theft on that stage. And yep. he inspired a movement. And not just the people who were already libertarians. He brought a ton of people into the party. So I don't think that a candidate necessarily has to have a different kind of strategy than an activist. I don't think when you're an activist, you go radical. And then once you run for office, you just completely switch to being all practical. I think that you can do both. Um, you can say like, hey, taxation is theft, yada, yada, yada. Here's what we should do to try to move in the right direction. Um, if you're more of a local candidate and yeah. you can actually make like an impact in the election, then maybe you focus more like, here's what we should do locally. Here's things that we can implement in my state or town or whatever. Um, but as far as like a national campaign, I mm -hmm. think that they should just go guns blazing. And I think Ron Paul is a great example of why. Well, you bring that. Let, let's show that because you actually do. You do bring up Ron Paul. So let's see if we can get Ron. The, you do bring that up next. Let's go through your video and we'll talk about that. For this. And now we are starting to see the results of their efforts. And this is true for everything. So at some point, activists for any issue ignore people calling them crazy, stupid. I agree with cetera, that completely. And they stand up for what they believe in. So I think you and I are on the same page with activists. Yeah. I think where we're disagreeing here is is the actual candidate piece. And you're about to bring up Ron Paul coming up here, right? In a minute. So I think so. For example, abolitionists literally put their lives on the line and Absolutely. risk being lynched because they believe slavery was morally reprehensible. Well, let's go down that road. All right, yeah. right let, let's stay on that road right there, if we could for a second. Abolitionists, you're totally correct. But if we look at the president who actually, Abraham Lincoln, who actually won, right, basically because of abolitionists, right? Without abolitionists, Lincoln doesn't win the presidency. He wasn't a strict abolitionist. Nope. He also wasn't about making black people equal to whites. He wasn't sure if he would actually, you know, where the black people would go once they're slaves, whether they should go back to Liberia or whether they, or, or back to Africa. And we'll, our, our colony time was Liberia. We were shipped to Liberia. He was actually not radical, if that makes any sense, compared to the abolitionists. In fact, when he did the when he did the Emancipation Proclamation, there were two states. I think it was Kentucky. I think it was Maryland. I think, but still had slavery. So he didn't free all the slaves. He only freed the slaves in the South as a punishment for war. Yeah. But there was still slavery was legal. I think it's uh, someone's. I'm sure going to correct me, but I think it was. I think it was Maryland and Kentucky where there was there was still slavery. So I think my argument here, there's a difference between the pretty radical abolitionists. And you're right. If you're anti-slavery in 1850, you're a radical. No question. That's a radical message. But I think Lincoln, he found that middle ground as a candidate to go, well, you know, black people aren't equal. I'm not saying that. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying we got to free them all. I'm not saying they're going to come back to your house. We'll probably send them back to Africa. I mean, he was doing that. And then that's what actually eventually got, you know, the slaves freed. Am, am I wrong with that? So whenever I'm talking about abolitionists, I was not referring to Lincoln at all. So from what I understand, Lincoln was like an actual racist. Um, he didn't care about ending slavery. He has this quote that if he can preserve the union and preserve slavery, he will. He just cared about preserving the union. Um, so whenever I'm talking about activists, um, a result of the Civil War was the 13th Amendment got passed and slaves ended up being freed. Um, but I, that's not really what I was talking about with Lincoln. Um, but, but Lincoln was, you know, part of that movement. He was, I don't think he was serious about it. I think he was just trying to capitalize to get elected. So um, you think he took on that to get elected? <laughs> I'm not entirely sure where uh, I'm going with that. I, I don't know if I can buy that one. You know what, you know what will get me elected? Free slaves. That'll Freedom. work. I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure that's, from what I know, and obviously I'm I'm absolutely not an expert on Lincoln, but from what I know, he did feel that slavery was wrong. I think he believed that it was wrong, but I don't think he was prepared to just, you know what, destroy the country for it. I don't think he was that radical. I, I think you're right. He wasn't that radical. I do think that in it, he did think it was wrong, but not enough to, you know, destroy the country over it. And yeah, abolitionists think... were prepared to burn the country down over it. Yeah, I don't think that was his focus at all. I think he was just worried about preserving the Union. Mm, and then the okay. slavery just happened to be a wartime measure that punished the South. <laughs> is that what it was? Okay. He was just punishing people. So Lincoln, Lincoln was basically a jerk is what you're saying. Okay. <laughs> Lincoln was a tyrant, yes. He, he was a jerk and he just wanted to punish people. <laughs> all right, yeah, maybe you're right. It, it's totally possible. So, well, let me – if you think that 
you know, you might be a jerk and you're having problems, you might want to consider some CBD products to calm yourself down. Hold on one second. Listen to this. Hey, it's Larry hey, Sharp, host, host, host of the Sharp the Show. Want to talk to you for a couple, couple of seconds, seconds only, only about CBD, about CBD products. products? Look, if you think, Look, if you think that they should be they part, should of, be your part of your health regimen, health regimen or they, already or are. they already are. You're dealing with, you're dealing with pain, pain, pain or, anxiety, or anxiety or some other, or some issue. other issue. Head on head over to GrownSelectionLex.com. Check them out. They're a libertarian-owned company. They understand that you own your body and treat yourself the way you should be treated. Of course they do. They you do, do, and you and so do, do I. So do I. So head over there. So head over there. Check them out. Check them look out. Look at their CBD products. If they, products, if they, if they think they fit, fit your health, your regimen, health regimen, put in put in a sharp twenty and get twenty percent off your your order. order. Look, I want look, you to support, I want you to support liberty movement, liberty movement, libertarian, libertarian owned businesses, businesses, and the show. And the show they're, a they're a sponsor. If CBD, if CBD is or is should be part of your part of your health. Regimen, regimen, grown, grown selection, selection com. Dot com. Check them out. Check them out. Purchase, purchase. Sharp weight, sharp weight, 20, 20, 20, 20 percent off. Percent off. Support the show. Support the show. Support the movement. Support the movement. Grown, grown selection, selection. Dot com. Dot com. That guy's smart. Listen to him. So, so, um, I guess I, I do consider, I mean, when it came to abolitionists, Lincoln was their. He, he was their guy, if that makes any sense. He represented the abolitionists, right? He, like like Gary Johnson or Joe Jorgensen, represented the libertarian movement. Didn't Lincoln represent the abolitionist movement, or am I off there? I think the Republican Party was the party of abolition, and I think Lincoln was running as a Republican. So I think, yes, he did take up that mantle, but for him personally, it wasn't really his focus. So I think his thing was he was more worried about preserving the Union. All right, let's keep going. And they won. So, Congressman Paul, and I'd like you to take here's your to answer this. You're basically saying that we should take our marching orders from Al Qaeda. If they want us off the Arabian Peninsula, we should leave. No, I'm saying we should take our marching orders from our Constitution. We should not go to war. Now, look at this. He's a minority here, right? Most people are like, what's this guy talking about? There's a couple of people going, yeah, get some, Ron. But it looks like most of the crowd's like, this guy's nutty. That is such a great line from him. No, I want to take my marching orders from the Constitution. In this picture, though, most people look like, what is he talking about? Yes. If, you, if you check back in four years later, it was completely the other way. He got the loudest cheers out of ever, out of anyone. Okay. We should not go to war without a declaration. We should not go to war when it's... No one is inspired whenever you back down from what you believe. I've mentioned this before, but Ron Paul inspired a new libertarian movement by walking on stage in front of a hostile audience and speaking the truth. He was booed, scolded, yep. called crazy by the corporate press. Okay. It's time we quit this. It's yep. time. It's trillions of dollars we're spending on these wars. And they're laughing at him. <laughs> there goes crazy Uncle Ron. <laughs> Yep. the unsustainability of multiple wars. <laughs> Ron Paul now is a legendary figure in libertarianism. Yeah, but see, this is the issue that I have, and, and, and I'm going to be, uh, I want to be clear on this. Yeah. I'm a Ron Paul fan. I've opened for Ron Paul at events, right? I've introed him. I, I'm a fan. At the same time, Gary Johnson got more votes than him, right? Gary Johnson was more effective than him. The average non-libertarian knows Gary Johnson more than they know Ron Paul. If I talk, if I talk to people in New York City now, and I say Ron Paul, they go, "Who's that guy?" You mean Rand Paul? They know Rand Paul because he's active now. They don't know Ron Paul. I go Gary Johnson, they go Aleppo, but <laughs> but they know him, right? So it may not be great, but they know Gary Johnson. The, the, a non-libertarian doesn't know Ron Paul very well. Libertarians do, absolutely, but non-libertarians, not so much. And a lot of people who joined the liberty movement, many of them, when Ron Paul went back to the Republican Party, many of them went back to the Republican Party. We didn't keep that many. Well, we kept some, but we didn't keep as many as we could have in the libertarian movement. It, it's, I guess what I'm saying is you're saying, look at how great he was. And I think anyone could say, well, look what Gary Johnson did. Am yes. I wrong? So Gary Johnson, I mean, props to him. He got, what was it, three and a half percent of the vote? Yep. That's really good for a libertarian. So, yeah, he deserves credit for that. Um, couple points with that, though. So he was riding off the Ron Paul wave, 
So I think that's an important thing to point out. I think that Ron Paul kind of broke it. 2012, he was running what? 2012, he, really? Not in You're 2012, in 2016. 2016 yeah. He was running off the Ron Paul wave from eight years before? Four years before, yes. So Ron Paul inspired the movement in 2012. You get all these new people in, and then in 2016, their libertarians are ready to go. Oh, and, that's okay. That's yeah. okay. That's All right. Saying. And then the other point, I think that in 2007 and 2008 in those debates, Ron Paul really broke down the doors for Gary Johnson to do well. So if you look at the two candidates before Gary Johnson in 2012, I believe it was Bill Barr in uh, 2008. He got like 0.4% of the, yeah. vote. the guy before that, I think even less. After Ron Paul ran in 2008, Gary Johnson did better in 2012, in 2012 and better yeah. in 2016. Yep. Yeah. I think that is because Ron Paul really brought the ideas to the mainstream and made them digestible to the average person who was watching those debates. So that's so you think that's that's the way it works. Yes. So does that mean that someone like a Ron Paul then is he the is is he the marine who goes in first and breaks the hole and then the Gary Johnson goes in? Or so, is Ron Paul the guy who eventually is able to win? So in 2008, you could say that he was the guy in D-Day who uh, got in on the first ship at Omaha, something right. like that. Um, you could say something like that. I think having more Ron Pauls would be better. So if every candidate was a Ron Paul, that would be ideal. Um, I think that a Ron Paul can make it easier for someone like a Gary Johnson. But ideally, they would all be Ron Pauls. I don't think it's Ron Paul needs to open the door, and then we have someone else go in. My my worry again becomes: I feel like if we're looking, if if we're if we're looking to bring in people who already believe this, I think you're right. But how do, how does someone who doesn't or and the reason why I'll say this, and this is a personal for me, right? All the time, Dave Smith bothers me on this one, right? <laughs> he says, he goes, yeah, Gary Johnson didn't bring in anybody until I met you, Larry. You're the only guy. That's what he says to me. I'm the only guy Gary Johnson brought in. Yep. But I did come in from Gary Johnson, right? I mean, I was around in 2008. I couldn't hear him. In my view, where I was, and this is going to sound funny for some of you who've been watching for a long time. In 2012, I thought Gary Johnson was radical. That's where my head was, right? My head was, what What are you guys, librarians? What? Oh, libertarians. Uh, I mean, that's where my head was, right? I, I wasn't there. And I think most Americans now are where I was then. I couldn't hear. I, I didn't know what the Ron Paul revolution was until like 2013, 2014. I didn't know what it was. That's that's how my where my head was. And that's why I'm thinking this, right? Let me wrong again. I'm a fan. I got it once I got it. But if you go back eight years ago, I don't remember this. This isn't a thing for me. And I think most Americans are like me. And remember, I'm my age also, I'm over 50, right? I'm over 50. So and most voters are over 50. So I'm much more representative of the voting class than someone who's 30 or 20, right? As a general rule. That's my worry. That, are my concerns clear or no? Um, so I think one of the things with Gary Johnson is supposed, well, one of the things with Gary Johnson, he got 4 million votes in 2016, something yep. like that, four and a half. Yep. Uh, it didn't really amount to much. It didn't amount to a whole Valid lot point. of new LP members. I mean, Valid I think point. it was mostly people with a protest vote and that was it. No, it's a valid point. I, I, I don't think that, uh, while I love Gary Johnson, um, I don't think that he was as impactful at all as, as I had hoped or as I wanted him to be. I, I completely agree. And I also I, I also think that the, the loyalty, I mean, the Ron Paul revolution people are very loyal to him, right? He, he has a, a bigger personality by far than Gary Johnson has. And I think some of it is because of his radical message. I agree with you. Um, I, my, I guess my concern is how far does the does the Ron Paul revolution go when it comes to bringing in the average guy or gal who walks in the streets of New York? I don't have that answer, right? I know that, and, and again, I'm looking at this from my point of view. I'm a New York City guy. I'm I cross New York State. People still recognize me. 
And I think most, the average person thinks I'm radical. The average libertarian does not think I'm radical, right? <laughs> so, but the average person does. When I was talking about ideas like, um, you know, and I think you know this, I was about ideas of, um, uh, you know, uh, leasing naming rights to bridges to raise money. So we would stop having to raise taxes because you can fund a government without taxes. That blew people's minds. <laughs> like they were like, what is he saying? Like the amount of pushback I got, like, you can't do, oh, um, you can't, what? Oh my God. And I asked him why. And they had no answer because clearly it was just evil, right? There was, why well, would I have to say anything? But libertarians were like, yeah, you know, I'd rather have nothing, right? They, they were like, whatever. <laughs> but non libertarians thought it was radical. Uh, am I off? Um, with the naming rights thing, I think that was a great idea. My dad and I were talking about that, and my mm -hmm. dad thinks that that was like absolutely genius, and I agree with him. So <laughs> there we go. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, Trevor says Larry's known as the naming bridges guy. Yes. That's often true, right? <laughs> That's often true. So, and I'm not saying make all drugs legal. I'm just saying, how about we name a bridge? So I, I think you can do both. Am I wrong? No, yeah, I think you can. I think if you're running for something like New York governor, then yeah, you want to focus on what can I do for my state and New York City. Um, whereas if you're running a national campaign, you want to take on more national issues like legal, like ending the war on drugs or ending all the wars. Okay. Well, the other thing that I find is, you know, he talked about the Constitution. I don't know if you know many left Democrats, and I don't, I don't mean the average Democrat. I mean a left-leaning Democrat. I know many, and a lot of left-leaning Democrats, they don't, they don't think the Constitution is a viable answer, right? They don't think it's viable. So for a perfect example, the Second Amendment, right? In New York State, the Second Amendment is the second suggestion. And the First Amendment is the first suggestion. That's how that works, right, in New York State. Now, this, and I'll go back to what, you know, Dave, Dave Smith will say, because I know you're a Dave Smith fan, uh, what he says, he, it's a piece of paper, it's how it's enforced, right? And in New York State, the Constitution is a, you know, mm, I don't know, right? I don't know. So I'm not sure that kind of thing works across the aisle. Am I wrong? No, yeah, I completely, I completely agree with you on that. I'm not a constitutionalist. I think that it can work as an appeal to the right. Like, hey, you say that we believe in limited right. government, um, and we have this document that you guys don't want to follow. Um, as far as it getting to the left, I don't think they care about the Constitution. I think many don't, right? Yeah. I think many don't, right? So, all right, let, let, let's keep going. Maybe I'm off here. Let's keep going. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're almost done, guys. We're almost done. <laughs> It's a good video, though. Going back to marijuana legalization, a more dangerous position is that all drugs should be legalized. Yep. Ron Paul not only argued in the Republican debates that all drugs should be legal, but he argued on Morton Downey Jr. in 1988 and was berated by idiots for 15 minutes. Just the other day, they walked into the house. They suspected he was a drug dealer. He was using his automatic selector. And the police marched in and they said, it looked like a gun after they killed the man. Mm -hmm. In America. Is that what America is all about? I'd say no. We want privacy. We want due process. See, this is where I think he failed. This is going to sound crazy. Really? But this is where I think he failed. Because how did he come up with that? How did he respond to that? Right after he said a terrible thing, he said, is this America? We want privacy. We want due process. No, we don't. Americans don't want either of those two things. Now, libertarians do. Americans just want safety. That's what Americans want. And we've proven that a million times. We have sacrificed our freedom for safety so many times. That's what Americans want. I think his mistake there was, again, falling back to the ideas of what the Constitution was. I know it's, for some of you in a right, you're ready to just jump through the, 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 you know, the, the computer and choke me. But I'm just telling you what I think Americans are talking about, right? They what 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 I would have said if it's me is I would have said, do we really want our police force killing its citizens? Do you want to be shot by a cop because you're looking at your TV wrong? That's the part where I think Ron Paul often fails. 
he falls back to the Constitution when the right completely buys that. But the left doesn't. The left doesn't buy that, right? So you wind up getting half of the country go, Ron Paul, well done. And then half the country go, oh, no. And then, of course, when he goes legalize drugs, the right who goes, Constitution, oh, drugs, no. <laughs> right? And yeah. the left goes, drugs, yes, oh, Constitution, no. So I think he winds up fighting both sides. And I think that's the reason. I'm not saying it's right what I'm going to say. So don't get mad at me. But I'm giving a reason, ex explanation. I think this is why the Gary Johnson types of the world went with the physically conservative and socially liberal, which I hate. I'm just explaining why I think they went there. Because if you watch Ron Paul, he gets that both sides don't like him because he hits one of them that they don't like. Let this like constitution. Right doesn't like drugs. Am I wrong? I think that you're making a valid point about the Constitution. Um, I think that if you're a libertarian, you're going to get flack from both sides, regardless of whether you talk about the Constitution or not. So, yeah, with Ron Paul, that's like the one criticism I have with him. I think he focused too much with the Constitution. So a lot of times he would say for war, you have to have a declaration of war and stuff like that. I don't think he should have focused on that. I think he should just say war is wrong. Yes, yeah. that's that's yeah. my point. I agree. Yes, that that's my point. And I think that's why the left all of a sudden do doesn't always do it. To be to be forward, he's 100% correct. Yeah. I'll give him a record. I'm saying we're talking messaging. And I got to tell you, when I ran for governor of New York, I didn't get that much pushback on those things. Because when I talked about drugs, I didn't talk about people getting high. I <laughs> talked about farmers having a cash crop. I talked about people dealing with their own pain issues. I dealt with poor people being able to, to, to grow their own medicine. I didn't talk about the right to freedom. You know, people ask me all the time about, Larry, where's it better to talk about libertarianism or libertarian principles? I say neither. The average non-libertarian doesn't care. I say show, give people libertarian solutions, and they tend to remember you, and they tend to want to hear you, and then it draws them in. I look at myself, and this is how I look at candidates, which is why I think myself and many other libertarians disagree. I look at candidates not to motivate the base. I look at candidates to draw in non the non-base, right? And what I, I, I was teasing people here in New York State, there are a lot of people who support me in New York State who aren't libertarian. They call themselves Larrytarians. They don't call themselves libertarians. And I'm, I'm I'll take that. Would I rather have them libertarians? I would. And that's why I push the party. And that's why I do this. And that's why I try to get them to change their registration. Right? That's why I do that. Because I, I want them to become libertarians. But I also recognize that I'm a recruiter. And that I don't give the party libertarians. I give them raw recruits. And then I hope that over time, the people who've been here can turn them in to better libertarians. As a general rule, I think you'd agree with this. If you spend about six months a year with us, you either run away in fear or you become one of us. Yeah, I think it's that's kind of what happens, <laughs> kind of what happens right? <laughs> so uh, absolutely. So I think that that I guess is, is my concern. I think you I, I think throw, like I think throwing out the, the, the liberty piece is sometimes not the right first step. Am I wrong here? I think that you can make a more powerful message if you start with saying the wars are wrong or if mm -hmm. you start with saying it's wrong that we throw people in jail for having the wrong plant or stuff like that i think that that is the most powerful way to start and if people want you to elaborate you can elaborate on that mm, but i okay. think that you should start by just saying like this is wrong i like it all right let's keep going you got more you, you made a nice video so we got to keep going <laughs> i'm messaging Oops, but i would say that they both had hold on i screwed up by mistake i'm sorry <laughs> has looked better as time is going on go. and meanwhile morton downey jr died of lung cancer from smoking that was Gary a johnson repeatedly when he was asked about his view on drug legalization would simply say i think marijuana should be legalized and we should do it as a medical issue not a criminal issue that's fine to say but whenever you are answering directly after ron paul who just said legalize heroin that comes across as weak gary johnson was featured in a republican debate in 2012. do you remember anything about his performance I popular do. opinion changes sure. those on the margin <laughs> make bold stances i'm trying to moderate radicalism 
So you think moderating radicalism is is not a good idea? Yes, I think that was um, the major problem with Gary Johnson. And that, um, do you remember anything about his performance? That was specifically for you, Larry, because I knew that you did. Yes, no, <laughs> the, the issue, uh, I remember, I don't think the performance, I remember the interview after. And the thing that I remember that I loved about Gary Johnson is he was talking about as governor, um, how would he pick, um, how would he pick um, judges? And he said he would ask them this question. If the legislature had passed a law that if you were 17 years old and you were caught and convicted of spraying graffiti on a wall, the sentence was mandatory death, that you had to, you had to sentence a 17-year-old kid to death. That was the law, mandatory, no exceptions. And you got a kid and the jury said guilty. What do you do? And he said, the only person he wouldn't pick as a judge is someone who said, sentence him to death. Mm. That was that was a no hire. That you couldn't do that. That you had to have the morality to go, okay, I either have to resign or find a way or do something, but I'm not sentencing, sentencing a 17-year-old kid to death for graffiti. I'm not doing that. That stuck with me. So these are the ways, you know, what I love about Gary Johnson more than anything um, isn't his policies isn't his speaking ability, is Gary Johnson's a good man. That's what I love about him more than anything. He's a good man. And I know that sounds so cheesy, but I think where my head was in 2012, I was so unhappy with politicians. I was so disappointed. I was so broken by them that just to find a, a good man, I was like, what? They exist? What? A good man exists in politics? Oh my God. And I think that's why I was more enamored with him than anything else, to be forward with you. So, yeah. So let's let's see how uh, John Stossel gets beat up. <laughs> this is why people think libertarians are. <laughs> We're living in a country that is 70 percent socialist. The government takes 60 percent of your money. They are. Uh, they're taking care of your health care, of your pensions. They are telling you who you can hire, what the regulations can be. What do you have to do with the drug And war? you want to suck up to your little liberal friends and say, oh, but we want to legalize pot. You know, if you if you were a little more manly, you'd tell the liberals what your position on employment discrimination is. How about that? So the last two. Yeah, but see, Trump did that. Right? Am I wrong? Trump won an election and got elected president. He did. Absolutely, but he didn't win over the country. We're also on the brink of civil war. I'm not sure that's a, I don't know if that that's that's a win, right? I mean, for him personally, yes, don't get me wrong. I give Trump total credit for the win. Well done, home run. But the country's on the verge of civil war. I mean, I'm not sure that that result was the result I wanted. We have lockdowns now. We're still at war, right? I mean, the country now has less freedom, not because of him, right? I'm not, I'm not blaming him. I'm saying the outcome right now is the country has less freedom now than it had before he was elected. And that's mostly because of our, our, our dumb response to COVID. But my point is the country hasn't changed. Like we aren't like, oh, go, go, oh, let's let, we need more freedom. The, the country isn't thinking, the country is still thinking what I said before, we want safety. Whatever that is, we want safety. Oh, destroy us? Okay, can we have safety still? Then we'll take that. So I'm not sure she's right. So I think if Gary Johnson had been elected in 2016, by some miracle, say Gary Johnson wins the election over Trump and Hillary, I think the same thing would have happened now. They would have panicked. They would have said Gary Johnson is a racist. They would have said the country is over. They would have blamed him for everything. I nope. think if you get a guy in there who's not establishment, that's what happens. No, Gary Johnson was straight up off the bat. He was like, nope, not doing it. Gary Gary Johnson, without question, um, would have would, would have not done lockdowns. No, yeah, I'm not no, saying no. that. I'm saying the corporate press would have treated him the same way that they oh, treated Trump. Oh, that's oh. what I'm saying, yeah. Um, I don't think Gary Johnson would have tried to do lockdowns, but I, I think I he would have gotten the same treatment from the media. I'm unsure. You might be right. I mean, there's no way we can know, right? We're, we're, we're speculating right now. And I have a shine on Gary Johnson still, so I'm going to be biased by what I say, mm -hmm. so just so you know that. But I think that what Gary Johnson would have tried to do right away is he would have tried to tear down the military industrial complex and definitely he would try to tear down uh, the drug complex. He would have taken cannabis off schedule one immediately. 
He said he would have done it. And he would have done that. Cannabis comes off schedule one right away, right? As soon as that comes off schedule one, you got a bunch of people who go, this guy's not that bad. We start ending wars. You got a bunch of people who says, this guy's not that bad. I mean, I, I don't think you find the vitriol. And plus, look, Trump is a big personality. It's easy to love him and it's easy to hate him. Whenever you have a big personality, it's easy to feel emotions towards that. Gary Johnson's not a big personality guy, right? It's so a lot of people aren't going to, it's not easy to love him or hate him. It's easy to be like, eh, it's, it's easy for that, if that makes any sense. I think they would have gone, because with Trump, they say, hey, he's a narcissist, a jerk, and he kind of gives them that argument. Uh, with Gary Johnson, I think they would have gone full in on, he's stupid and he doesn't know what he's doing. With the mm, Aleppo maybe. moment, I think that's the direction they would have gone with. And even someone like Ron Paul, nice old man. I seems like a perfectly good guy to me. Everything I've heard about him, he seems like a good guy. I would agree uh, 100%. They tried to paint him as a racist. So <laughs> I know. Yes. They yes. Yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah. But look, because the race card always seems to work. I know. I, it just seems to work so often. So people <laughs> try to call me a white supremacist before. I love that. Yes. Love well, because they, they, did, they didn't know I was black. They, thought, they just thought libertarian, he must be white. Yeah. So they paid me as a white supremacist, not even knowing who I am. It's fine. I was happy to take it. I'll, I'll take I'll take it. It's all good. So, yes, uh, it, it, it tends to work very often. So, all right, let's keep going with, with Gary Johnson. libertarian campaigns, the Johnson campaign and the Jorgensen campaign, they both had a major issue with messaging, but I would say that they both had different problems. So Johnson's main problem was what I alluded to a second ago, that he would take what I call moderately yep. radical positions. So this is advocating legalization of weed, but not harder drugs, mm -hmm. being against the income tax, but wanting to replace it with a consumption tax, yep. and describing libertarianism as someone who is fiscally Ooh. conservative and socially <laughs> <laughs> Gary Johnson, I wish he would be a little more Ron Paul. I just feel like Gary Johnson has this way of selling the libertarianism as this kind of like, well, you know, it's more practical if we do it. That is his way. way. I agree. He's right. It's like it's like talking about slavery, and you're like, mm -hmm. well, I just think overall this is an inefficient way to get cotton. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, dude! Like, and you're you're head abolitionist. <laughs> See, but that's this is my bonus one. Yeah. He's not head abolitionist, and, and and he's not the activist, so he's not head abolitionist. Lincoln wasn't head abolitionist, and if Lincoln had said it's not the best way to get cotton, the South would have listened to him and said, "Oh, that's a better way than slavery." Tell me, he would have opened the door. I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. So it's kind of like if you're talking to a leftist and you say, hey, I think we should legalize weed. I believe in gay rights and all this stuff. The second they find out the rest of what you believe, they're going to leave you. So I think it's kind of something like that. I oh, haven't found that. Really? I have not found that. What I have found is when I talk to people from the left, generally speaking, they think I'm a Democrat. When I talk to them from the right, they think I'm a Republican. That's what hmm. usually happens when I talk to people. Almost always. Most people think I'm that what they are. That's Larry, what usually happens. You are a better messenger than most. So I, I will say that. So oh, maybe is that what it is? Okay. Yep. You know what it is? I'm just I'm good looking. There you I'm go. Handsome. That's what it is. I'm just good looking. You're like so. the top like one tenth of a percentile. Like yes. you're right up there. Then I'm gonna have to do some more training, <laughs> I guess. That's my job. All right, fine. I'll buy it. I'll buy it. Let's see. I'll, I'll buy it. But but the, the, what you just saw, by the way, um, was Joe Rogan, obviously, right? Yeah. One of the reasons why I got on Joe Rogan is because of my ideas, right? It wasn't because I was radical. It's because I had plans that people thought, oh, my God, these are crazy plans, right? How do you – oh, my God, how do you do this? But I mean, to be forward, when I did my K through 10 plan, for some of you who don't know what that is, I had a way to, to change uh, schooling from K through uh, 12 to K through 10. Right. So the last two years wouldn't be in regular school. They would be in some form of either trade school, uh, prep school, something like that. But what the plan actually did was privatize two years of school. That's what it actually did. Even against uh, a, a New York state constitution that in New York state, education's a right. And the state must pay for every every New York resident from grades one through 12. That's in our constitution. 
So in our state, education is a right. And I got away with that the way I did it. I feel like one could easily say, Larry, you're watering it down. Why do you accept the validation of, of state schools at all? Why don't you move for a constitutional amendment to New York State to end education as a right? And libertarian-wise, that's accurate. They're correct. I, I can't argue with that. That's a, that's accurate. I, I, I feel like for me to make any movement, I had to go my route, which is kind of watering down. Or I, or I, I feel like if I went for all or nothing, I would have gotten nothing. Yeah, I understand that point. So like an example that comes up a lot is school choice. So like for someone like me, I think I don't believe in government schools, but if we could have school choice, that'd be great. And there are a lot of people who are against saying like vouchers and being allowed to choose where you go and being funded and funding the students, things like that. Um, I think all that stuff's great. I just think that um, if you just say school choice is that's it, that's it instead of going for the whole thing as well and saying, I don't think there should be schools, but this may be something we can do in the meantime. All right. Well, let's let's talk about uh, Joe Jorgensen. That's your next one you're going to beat up. You've been beating people up today. Beat this one up next. All right. Jorgensen, on the other hand, was much better on core libertarian issues. On policy proposals, I really don't have any problems with any. Did she have policies? Uh, so I wrote that down and then I looked at her website real quick and I was like, yeah, I guess she did have policies, but yeah, I don't remember no, ever hearing her. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> the, the problem wasn't messaging. The problem was there wasn't any policies. Okay? Yeah. What, what most people, if, if for those people who've actually run a real campaign and many have, but for those who run a real campaign against, you know, establishment candidates, you realize one thing, rhetoric does not work. Rhetoric only works when it's two parties because rhetoric becomes, I'm not the other. But once you have three or four, rhetoric fails. You have to have actual policies to make people go, what? Because it's totally unfair. If you're a third party, you have to have the special sauce or no one pays attention. And yeah. that's one of the reasons why we struggled this year because we didn't have the secret sauce. We didn't have the magical policy we didn't have the special thing. Yeah, that's a fair critique of my videos. I wasn't really thinking of it in terms of, oh, she said this, this, and this policy that I agree with. I was thinking more in terms of, well, she didn't say any policies that I don't agree with. So I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, that's valid. I'll buy yeah. that. Okay, there we go. I think she was advocating. Where she completely dropped the ball was in pandering. Now, don't misunderstand this. Obviously, you want to pitch libertarianism differently to a liberal than a conservative. If you're ever in an elevator with Jerome Powell, your elevator pitch probably shouldn't be about ending the Fed. But all you should do is change the presentation, not the substance. So, for an example, abolish the police and privatize the police are two ways of saying the same thing. One has more appeal to the left, and one has more appeal to the right. Ron Paul, whenever he pitched legalizing heroin to the conservative crowd, he pitched it as being an extension of the right to practice their religion. Where the issue comes in is whenever you go against libertarian principles in an attempt to gain attention or to be agreed with. So doing this is bad. Doing this whenever there is a clear and obvious violation of civil liberties that you could focus on is worse. So whenever Joe Jorgensen comes out and says it's not enough to be passively anti-racist, we must be. <laughs> That's anti-libertarian, and I think Michael Mouse's reply there completely sums up why. But I'm actually not, and this is going to sound crazy, I'm actually not mad at her for that. I'm not mad at the campaign for that. What I was annoyed is the response. Hmm. And I say this because as a candidate who's run before, we make mistakes. Every candidate group makes mistakes, says something stupid, says something they shouldn't have said, jumps on board, makes an error literally in typing and it goes up on Twitter. And you're like, oh my God, the world's ending. That happens that every single one, if, if anyone is watching, listening out there, if you've been in a campaign or run a campaign, you know that happens. I did it too. I made tons of mistakes in my campaign. What bothered me about that is there wasn't the appropriate response, right? There wasn't a, oh, here's what I actually meant, right? Or I shouldn't have said it that way. What I should have said is, or changing it from should and must and all the, should and must is critical. Once you put must in libertarians, oh my God, they're angry. 
<laughs> oh my God, they're angry. You can't say must. You got. I learned that lesson early. You got to say, it is my opinion that you should, but you don't have to, right? I can say you shouldn't, you should eat your vegetables. You should, and we all should eat vegetables, but I can't say you must under the penalty of law. Yeah. So with that tweet, what it implies by saying it's not enough to be passively anti-racist. So if I'm just sitting on my couch in my living room and, hey, I'm not racist, that's not enough. I need to go out and I need to be anti-racist. Yes. That's my problem with it. And yeah, after she made that tweet, I was still on board with Joe Jorgensen. It was basically just an accumulation of things and they doubled down on the Black Lives Matter and all that stuff. That so, was my issue. The response yeah. was, you know, and 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 I'm going to give them it's the same thing that happened with Gary Johnson. Now, I learned from Gary Johnson a lot. I learned a lot of the errors that the campaign made. And my campaign didn't make, make those mistakes. It made other mistakes. It didn't make those mistakes, right? And the one thing um, that I think Gary Johnson believed, and most libertarians do when they run, once they start running, they start thinking, you know what? If I act more like the mainstream, if I do more like mainstream, then they'll give me more respect. That is a common mistake that many libertarian candidates do. I think this was theirs. They saw BLM as the big mainstream thing. We'll jump on board. The press will give us press and it'll be worth it, right? If we screws up, the press will be worth it is what I believe they thought. That's what Gary Johnson thought, right? If I just go down the mainstream, he said it, six lane highway down the middle. That was Gary Johnson's thing. I remember it still. I know I'm a geek anyway, but that was his thing, right? Six lane highway down the middle. He believed it. Clearly he was wrong. So was Joe Jorgensen. I did not play that game. My policies were not down the middle. My policies were, we're making real change. We're shifting things. Where I made errors, I thought that if I was more mainstream in things that I did, I would get more press. Even that's wrong, right? Even that's wrong. You don't get respect no matter what. <laughs> that's just how it works. I thought that that would work. So I still had my problems too, but I think that's what she did. And I guess that bothers me most is, some campaigns actually ask my opinion. Most don't. <laughs> Most just go, Larry lost, so he must suck. And I get it. It's fine. And th the problem is our party, what usually happens is somebody runs, they lose, they go away. I ran. I lost. I'm still here. <laughs> Now, of course, as soon as you lose, people start taking dumps all over you. You're bad. You're stupid. It's because of this. If you had been more radical, if you had been more passive, if you had been taller or shorter, raise more money, not raise them up, whatever. They've all got everyone's now money more than quarterback. Quarterback. I just didn't care, <laughs> right? So, I didn't, but a lot of people they they really leave. So anyway, I guess my my point of this whole thing is, I'm not as mad with what they did. I'm upset with the response because I, I gotcha. get why they did what they did like i've been there i get the mindset it was it was a is a common mistake that still libertarians next year will make the same mistake that will keep happening it's yeah. a common mindset but the response as you said not great yeah not great. no i mean everyone says like dumb things that you wish you could take back and stuff that's fine but they kept up with it they focused on that instead of focusing on the lockdowns which are just awful yes. i mean they're authoritarian Yep. And that was your clear out. You could say, hey, we're anti-lockdowns. We side with small business owners. And instead, they decided to pander to the woke left and a group that will never agree with them. And what also bothers me is literally uh, in March, I put down 10 videos on how to deal with COVID without a lockdown. I literally said no lockdown required. In March, I gave 10 videos on my Sharpway YouTube page. You think somebody would watch them and say, how do we put this into our campaign? Nope. Yeah. Well, you'll know for next time, I guess. <laughs> so <laughs> there we go. There we go. Speaking out against racism is easy. Speaking out against lockdowns, mask mandates, etc., is not. Fighting racism takes about the same amount of courage as fighting Peter Dinklage. Why'd you beat him up? I mean... <laughs> Nate Robbins? Better, better. Okay. Speaking better. out against, say, mask mandates is nearly equivalent to being an abolitionist in 1855. Maybe you don't well, have to worry about getting lynched, 
but it takes a lot of courage to go out against the popular narrative and the corporate press and stand up for freedom. Johnson didn't know these things. Jorgensen didn't have the courage to say them. The major problem with libertarian messaging is we are afraid to side with the truth whenever it's unpopular. <laughs> Dave had this to say about what the libertarian message for 2021 should be. In the lockdowns, foreign wars, corporate welfare, audit or in the Fed, support all self-defense, resist the cathedral. This part scares me too. Really? Right? I'm going I'm to drop the, the, the banner here so we can see what he actually said. That does scare me. And the reason why I say that is if you look at this here, end the lockdowns immediately open and, and, and open the uh, economy completely. I'm looking at my state right now. And again, I'm obviously biased by my state. Most New Yorkers don't want this at all. At all. They're like, no, lock it all down. So these evil businesses die. So what? They'll make their money back. That's how most New Yorkers think. Most New Yorkers are okay with the lockdowns. In fact, asking. Where I live in Queens, we have a special number to narc on people. That's how bad it is. We have a special number you call to narc on people and say, oh, they're not wearing masks. Yes, that's where I live in Queens. That's how bad it is. So I'm not sure this is accurate. I, I think the message is find a way to open the economy. And that I think is missing, right? I, I came up with plans nine months ago. I have actual plans and anyone who cares can watch the videos um, that I talked about on how to keep the economy open, still stay safe. And still keep the economy going. And I, I think that is, I'm not sure about that one. Th am I making sense or no? Um, I get what you're saying. I think with the lockdowns, that's something where we can't give up any more ground. We can't say find a way because they keep on shifting the goalposts. It goes from flatten the curve to just wear a mask yeah. to just get vaccinated to, well, even if you get a vaccination, we still need to lock down more. So I think on that issue, I don't care how unpopular it is. I'm going to stand against lockdowns, any government restrictions on that. Could you have end the lockdowns with here's the plan how? Um, or I'm no, not, it's got to be just end them, just no plan, just end them. I think it's kind of like getting the troops out. It's just, hey, we sent them in. Let's just get them out. Hey, we started the lockdowns. Let's just end them. My worry is even the foreign wars, right? The lockdowns, the left is all about keeping yep. the foreign wars. In theory, the average left person is against it. In practice, they're mediocre. The right is all about keeping the foreign wars going. They say they're not, right? They, when, when Trump says it, they go, yay. But if Trump's not in power, they're going to be about foreign wars again. They're the ones who say, oh, we have, we got to fight them before they fight us over here. I'm not sure that's true either. I'm not sure Americans actually want to end all the foreign wars. Maybe I'm wrong. This one I'm unsure of, but there's a part of me that says we're still scared that the bad guys are going to come get us. Or are we more scared of the Chinese now? <laughs> Seriously. So I, so I think with that, um, I think that these are good points. I think these are what libertarians should be fighting for. Maybe right now they're not popular. Okay. But I think that the goal is, hey, we're going to be the people to stand up whenever everyone's against us and we're going to push for these things. So like the lockdown's wrong. Foreign wars, absolutely evil morally reprehensible in every way i don't really care whether or not it's popular we want to end the wars and that should be our message even though the military industrial complex is a massive jobs program that probably I, I, i'm gonna guess i don't know exactly but probably employs five million americans i don't really care about that i mean that may be a certain point uh if someone's uh works for raytheon they may care about that um, but if someone works, I don't know. Okay. If someone owns a sweatshop, I don't really care if they lose their factory either. Okay. Um, I, I think the corporate bailouts and the audit, the fed are wonderful. I think most people would, would, the people who understand the fed would get it right. Half Americans don't even know that the feds not a, a, a part of the government, but I'm okay with those two. The, the other one that scares me, the last two scare me, the, the top two mm -hmm. scare me and the bottom two scare me. The, 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 the support self-defense by armed citizens against rioters and or cops. Again, I'm going from where I live. New Yorkers disagree. They disagree. They do not like guns. I'm sorry. Upstate New York does. Rural New York does. City New York does not like guns, period. We, city, 
city, the city will say, you know, disarm the police or whatever they'll say, and next year we'll give them money again. I mean, I'm I'm not sure. And boy, are they scared. You 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 saw New uh, De Blasio, my mayor, and Cuomo, my governor, basically get behind defund the police by saying nothing or actually doing it. De Blasio's actively did it, did it, and dropped a billion dollars off of our budget for our cops. And then once someone fought the cops for a lockdown, they were all about back to blue. They were like, back to blue. Oh, we love our cops. You can't mess with cops. Three months ago, they're funding them. And now they're like, cops are the greatest things in the world. I don't know. I'm I'm not sure that, that that's... I think the fear of guns is huge in America still. So with the cop issue, I think that's something that's completely backwards, that the right supports the cops and the police don't. Like, <laughs> I think that should be flipped. Like, totally. It's kind of makes it harder that it's not. But yeah, with the lockdowns and everything, that's enforced by cops. Yeah. The left should support the cops. The right shouldn't. It's weird. <laughs> it's weird. And but, uh, the other one, resist the cathedral always. I go back to what I think about you know, Americans in general. We like safety. And if the church will give us safety, we're okay worshiping the Pope, right? If, if I, you know, I hear all the time for libertarians, I'm going to run so that I can give people real choice. Americans don't want real choice. Mm-hmm. Americans would take you as their king if they thought you'd be a benevolent king. They would vote in the king if they thought to be a benevolent king or their king. They don't want choice. They want answers to their problems they want safety. They want jobs. They want day-to-day life. Resist the cathedral sounds, and it's going to sound crazy I'm saying it, just because where maybe it's because where I live. I think most Americans are like, no, 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 no. I like my cathedral. <laughs> so I think what he's just saying by resist the cathedral, I think, I mean, I'm not Dave Smith, but I think he's just talking about uh, just go against the private, or uh, excuse me, the corporate press and what they're pushing. So they're pushing all these different things. So back in June, it went from stay in your home to go out right. and riot back to stay in your home again. Um, so he's just saying, go against the popular narrative that the corporate press is pushing. Just be yourself, be brave. And that I completely agree with. I like be yourself, be brave. See, now that's the message I'm behind. We got to call <laughs> Dave up. Say, pull out cathedral thing off and write, be yourself, be brave. That's a good one. I like that. It's like a Disney <laughs> thing. People will eat that one up. That's it, yes. Wars, corporate welfare, auditor in the Fed, support all self-defense, resist the cathedral. I'm not saying this is perfect. Could something be added or reworded? Sure, probably. But this is what libertarian messaging should be. Every libertarian agrees with these points. There's no identity politics, and it's unapologetically radical. The corporate press may not agree with any of these points, but are we trying to befriend the cathedral or destroy it? Now, there's my last point. I'll bring up, but thank you. This was a great video. I, I appreciate that. But this goes back to my first question, which is the idea of what is the goal? And I'll go back to Lincoln, the man you call the tyrant. Uh, I'll, go back to, I'll go back to Lincoln. And did Lincoln say, if I befriend my enemy, haven't I destroyed my enemy? Don't I want to convert everybody? Don't I want the corporate media to eventually be fair? Don't I want the you know the the powers that be to be more libertarian? Is it isn't that the goal or no? They're never going to be more fair to us. I think they were fair to someone like Gary Johnson in a way where they gave him airtime, like the CNN town hall, but then they just completely turned on him and backstabbed him and said, "Hey, he's an idiot who doesn't know about Aleppo." Um, with the ending the cathedral, um, I think for me, my goal is to convert people. I think we need to convert people. Um, I think that we need to be radical and we need to be bold. We have the best political philosophy ever des- ever devised. That's I true. think we need to go all out. We don't need to moderate. We don't need to try to be accepted by people who hate us. I think we need to be ourselves, go all in, and just say what we believe. Got to be be brave and, and be yourself, right? Unless you're Joe Jorgensen, then don't be yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, not gonna touch that one. All right, so let me, <laughs> grab, let me grab a couple of comments. Uh, they only know Gary Johns because it was recent. That, I think Jason, yeah. there, there's probably something to that. I think there's something to that. There, there, there's something to that too. It's true. Yep. Um, I agree with him. The national campaign should be the messenger 
and should really be about inducing people to the philosophy, generating press, and showing how we are different. That may take a more radical approach to make noise and not to be pushed aside. Otherwise, why would anyone give us a second look? As you work your way down the local levels, then local candidates need to have practical solutions still based around core libertarian beliefs, not using force. But the president candidate, I'm sure she wrote more. He wrote more. I, I think he's kind of agreeing with you. He's saying that that person should be more of a, a Ron Paul-ish for the presidency. So I guess, Chris, I assume what Chris is saying is you're not going to win the presidency. So you might as well be an activist if, if I get what he's saying. Yes, I agree with that point about not being pushed aside. If you're just running like a basic milk toast, like, hey, we're the reasonable party, no one's going to care about you. Um, and then on the other hand, if you're trying to pander to like the left wing, you're not going to get anything from that because everyone's going to go to the Green Party if they are going to go to a third party. Um, so, yeah, I agree with that point. That was a good comment. Jason says Ron Paul is way better than Gary Johnson. I don't, I don't want to make that decision, Jason. I don't want to make that decision. I'm going to, I'm going to stay out of that one. I know, for, I know Drew agrees. Yeah, we might be here for a little while talking about that one, Larry. I'm going to leave that one alone. I, look, I like Ron Paul. I do. There's no question. But I'm loyal to Gary. Gary brought me in. I'm loyal to him. I absolutely am. Yes. Um, how, how this kid knows that Larry doesn't is crazy. What do I not know, David versus Goliath? Let me know in the comments. I, you knew something I didn't know. So... All right. Gary Johnson was a former Republican. The media promoted the shit out of him until they saw him talk taking from him. That's Hillary. a good point. I hmm. think that's a good point. But 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 so was uh, Ron Paul. In fact, Ron Paul now is still Republican, right? Gary Johnson, I think, is officially still libertarian, I think. Um, but I'm not sure. I think he's still official libertarian. Well, um I think just what he's saying is that they thought Gary Johnson running as the LP candidate that he would take more votes from Trump than Hillary. Oh and, yeah. gotcha. And after okay. they saw that wasn't really true, then they turned on him. So I think that's a good point. See, I thought was, right, I think the debates and all those things for the media is all about, it's all about ratings. Sadly, Gary Johnson couldn't pull the numbers, right? They gave Gary Johnson, I think, it's my view. I, I, do, I have no proof of this. This is just my opinion. Take it for whatever you want. I think the media gave Gary Johnson and Bill Weld the spotlight because they thought, this might be another way of people watching. People might care because these are these are governors. Maybe people care. We'll make some money on this. And after the second, um, after after the second town hall, he wasn't pulling the numbers. People weren't crying for him, right? He didn't knock it out of the park. I think if you look at the opposite when that happened, which was when Jesse Ventura ran in Minnesota in the '90s, when he got debate stage, man, he knocked it out of the park. People wanted to see him. He did that cool commercial, like a wrestling commercial. And he, he, I mean, he was exciting and people wanted to see him, right? I, the, the other issue I found with the, with the Jorgensen campaign that was similar to the Gary Johnson campaign is they weren't exciting, right? Yeah. There, there wasn't exciting, right? The, the most exciting thing was the bat bitener. That was the most exciting thing that happened, right? <laughs> um, I'm serious, right? I mean, yeah. it wasn't much was. we weren't like, oh my God, right? We were like, oh yeah, sir. So, so Yeah. So I, I think that was an issue too. So yeah, uh, I, I'm starting to see where you're going with this Ron Paul thing. All right, maybe. All right. Ron Paul's that Marine, Larry. See, there we go. That's really? what it was. Maybe it was. <laughs> well, so, what, somebody once asked me when I was in Jersey, they said, Larry, what movie archetype are you? And I said, I'm Obi-Wan Kenobi. I'm the guy who goes in, gets killed by Darth Vader, so you all could win. See, I help you guys win. That's what I do. That's me. There we go. So... um. Joe Jorgensen was more left in the media's mind, so they didn't promote her because they worried she'd take from Biden. Mm. Um, I do think there's some of that, but I don't think because of left. I think if you look at how CNN was never as biased left ever compared to when Trump was elected. That is when CNN went full on open. That's it. Trump evil every day. 8 to 11, orange man bad. That's it. They went full on. That was it. And I think it wasn't because they thought Joe Jorgensen was left. They didn't want anybody taking votes. They didn't go Howie Hawkins. They didn't go um, Don Blankenship. They gave nobody press. They were like, no, we have to get rid of Trump. It's Biden and there's nobody else. That's literally what I think the press did. I think nobody got coverage. I they might have thought Jorgensen was more left, but they didn't care. They yeah. wanted nobody. If you if you look at people like 
um, the mainstream people on CNN, like the Don Lemons of the world. Some of you don't watch CNN, don't know who that guy is. But if you watch CNN, you know who he is. Um, I mean, they would say things like, you know, and you can't vote third party this time, right? Oh, God, why would you do that? They would speak that way. Bill Maher said like 14 times, you, you, you stupid people throwing your vote away. I mean, just they were just anti third party, period. So, yeah. I don't know. I think with this um, past election, yeah, they threw all their cards in. We're anti-Trump, and that was it. And then yes. I also think there's a point that, yeah, Jorgensen ran kind of a boring campaign, so why would you have her on? So, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, Mises Caucus is the last best hope for the LP. Why do you think that, Jason? Are you one of those guys who thinks the left's taking over the LP? We just talking about this. I hear this all the time. The guys in the right always tell me, left's taking over the LP. The guys in the left always tell me, right's taking over the LP. I don't think either side actually is. So I'm in the Mises caucus. Me too. Yeah. So, I mean, I... I'm on the advisory board. I don't know if the left is taking over, but I do think that there's more of a trend towards the establishment types to pander more towards the left to leftists rather than trying to attract everyone. So I think that is a legitimate concern. Uh, isn't, my... that, isn't that an issue though, right? I mean, if, if you look at today's America... It's much, and, and and I'm a recruiter, right? That's what I do. And I find that I people come, and this is my experience. I think most people would agree with this experience. People come to us faster from the right, but they also go back faster. People come back to us, come to us from the left slower, but they never go back. Hmm. They rarely go back. You look at some of our most active, forward, aggressive activists, many of them. I, I would say probably most of them have come from the left because when you come from the left and you become libertarian, that's your come to Jesus moment, right? You're, you, you're no longer a, you know, I'm a liberty leaning Democrat. No, you're a libertarian, but there's a whole lot of liberty leaning Republicans who come to us and then go back. So I think there is some value to having a hardcore push towards the left to bring them in. Because when you turn them, man, they're turned. I mean, have you felt this or no? Am I am I, am I off no, on this? I think I should be more clear. So first off, obviously this was different in the past. In 2008, they ran Barr. Um, right. So I think more specifically this past election with Jorgens, they appealed to the worst part of the left, which is the woke SJW left, who's never going to come over. That's if you look, point. if you look at a leftist who's going to come point. over, I think it's someone like Tim Pool or Dave Rubin, who they leave the left because they're anti woke, they're anti BLM, Agreed. and I think those are the type of people we need to go after. And you completely turn them off whenever you go into the BLM stuff, and you lose your chance of converting leftists. That's a valid point. It's yeah. a valid point. Uh, Tom, 2013-14, That's when I heard it too. Yeah, that's when I heard. Uh, that's when I heard Ron Paul was this time, right? I'm I'm late to the game, I guess. Huh? There we go. <laughs> um, Gary Johnson, known as the Aleppo guy, there isn't a single principle that people associate with him. This is a valid point, Mr. Wombat. I think this is a this is a valid point. I, I do think um, that's one thing Gary wasn't good at at all. He wasn't good. Gary Johnson is a what I call an instinctive libertarian. Like he just goes, yeah, that's kind of wrong. Like that's how we go. He, that's that's wrong. I don't like that. And it happens to be a libertarian, but it's not like he's like this hits the principle of this. I don't think that's who he is. I think he's just like that. You, you can't do that. I think that's why that's, yeah, it's a valid point. I still love Gary Johnson, Mr. Wombat, but uh, you're right. I agree with that. That's true. So Gary Johnson support means to the party as well. See that? He snatched that Democratic Party. It does happen. Take that, Dave Smith. That's two of us. <laughs> <laughs> See that? You're watching Dave Smith. That's two of us that came over, not just me. There we go. Exactly. Um, Gary Johnson's great, but he's not a torchbearer. It's true, and I think he actually said that, right? Gary Johnson said after the second one, he's like, I'm not the messenger. He actually said it. I mean, he said it publicly, and that's why he's kind of walked away, Jason. I think Gary figured it out. He's like, you know what? Not my gig. Did my best. Yeah. Not my gig. And, yeah, I, I wish we had uh, done better after him, though. I do think the thing I, I, I'm very happy with Gary is he did try his best. I mean, that'll give him. He tried. He, he wasn't. He wasn't the the guy, though. I think that's it. If people would explain what real liberty is, more people would be on board, I think. I think that's true, Desiree. I think people, libertarians, since we often spend so much time around libertarians, 
we assume that people get what we're talking about when they often don't. Uh, do you find do you find that that true? Um, yeah, I think that's true. So I think that um, if you're approaching it from a perspective of I think this policy, this policy, this policy, people just think it. Hey, that's a hodgepodge of policies. That's not really much of a philosophy. If you say, Hey, I believe liberty is self ownership. From that, you get property rights. From that, you get you shouldn't hurt other people or take their stuff. I think that is more of a coherent philosophy, and I think that you can draw more people in that way than if you're just, hey, we're the party that thinks common sense stuff. Got it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Joe says, any caucus in the LP is only furthering division within an already divided and polarized political party country. Right. No, he's got a point there, Drew. You're going, no, no but he's got a point. <laughs> he's got a point. Joe's got a point. Why do you think we got Joe Jorgensen as our uh, nom nominee? It's because the Mises people didn't want to vote for for Vermin, and the Vermin people didn't want to vote for Holmberger, and they were going to get mad at each other, left versus right. So both people got stuck at 40% or 30, 35%, and we all got our second choice, which was Joe Jorgensen. That's what actually happened, right? I mean, that's, that's how the actual election went. And by the way, I did a video, and I warned you all of this. <laughs> and as usual, nobody said but it's fine. It's it's yeah. there for posterity. They'll look back and go, God damn it, that Larry guy was right again. Um, I, I, disagree. I disagree with the premise that us being polarized is necessarily bad. If that leads to like secession and we split off into two different countries, I think that would be a huge win. Um, well, no, he means in the LP. Just in the LP? That's what, in this case, he means in the LP. He's saying any caucus in the LP is furthering division. That's That's what he's saying. Well, the party's going to disagree on stuff regardless. I don't really see libertarians always in fight. If you think that That's the Mises true. caucus is causing that, I don't know what to tell you. No, no, no. I don't think he was, call, was saying it was Mises' fault. And I don't think it's Mises' no. fault either. But I'm just saying he has a point. If you have caucuses, it does create an environment where people can go to their corners and fight. I think that's that's an accurate concern is my point. I wasn't blaming Mises. I wasn't blaming the Prague. Right? Yeah. Have you noticed? I don't get endorsed by anybody. Really? Because I won't hate the other. I don't know, Larry. You, I don't everyone, get endorsed by everyone. Everyone loves you, Larry. So. I, I appreciate that, but they won't endorse <laughs> me. Thanks. <laughs> yes. But yeah, but no, I don't, I don't, I, I think there is a, there is a concern there is all I'm saying. And I think as we have caucuses, we still want to make sure we have whatever, a, um, a UN, oh, sounds terrible, but a UN I, for the caucuses, right? A place where all the, all of them can get together and talk. And, and make things happen. And I feel sometimes we do fall into our caucuses and we don't talk to each other. There, there is a fear of I, that is what I'm saying. I get what you're saying, yeah. And I think we do have to recognize what Joe's saying, that it does, it, it does, um, it does mean it's easier to silo ourselves even more and we should probably be, act, be active on trying to talk more with each other. So Tony says, leasing names is more innovative libertarianism. Look at that, I love there that. You go. <laughs> you know, most Americans left and right want security more than freedom. Yes, Sam is correct. Left this one pronoun and internet safe spaces and right wings want border and tariffs. Both sides clutch their pearls over tax and spend. <laughs> yeah, it's very true. Yes. So I did show yours. I showed your comments, Joe. Don't get mad. I did it. I showed yours. You get mad at no, me. I'm now. very triggered. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> um, everyone now, um, everyone knows Larry is the regulate like onion. Thank you. Yes, that's the one I tried to use. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, Joe Jorgensen is the is the bat bite cat. Yes, candidate. Absolutely true. So um, I, is there anything that you want to bring up or talk about before we wrap this up, my friend? Uh, we covered a lot. I mean, my basic message is, yeah, let's we have the best political philosophy. Let's go for it. Let's be ourselves. Let's not be afraid of getting criticized. Um, stand up for what we believe in and not try to moderate it. I love that. For more on Drew, head over to twitter.com lockout days. Check him out there. But he's also on YouTube at lockout days also. So if you want to go there, you can go to both of them. And the video that I showed you is on his YouTube page, lockout days. Guys, I want to say thank you so much for talking with me this evening. Drew, thank you for coming. I appreciate the time you gave me. Guys, I will see you all. I promise you, I'll have a candidate tomorrow. I will see you all.